Watching the world burn, watching the world burn. October 13th, 2024. Let's get into it. Now, you know, I like on my channel to talk about many different topics. And so this is going to be a kind of an all over the place video. But all these things, I think, pertain to you, whether it's your health or real estate, global events. And so we're going to actually hit on all three in this video. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, because they had, they had this coupon at BJ's. I'm a member of BJ's. You're probably a member of Costco or uh, Sam's Club. And I'm not sure if this is there or not. But uh, so I wanted to try this out. This is called Synergy, S-Y-N-E-R-G-Y. Get that on the video. And this is raw kumbacha. And uh, so I've been doing some research on this. This stuff's really good for you, man. Helps with your digestion. It's good for detoxing the liver. Uh, it's supposed to help with your brain functions. <laughs> you know, it's like watching, and you can just go watch videos on YouTube. I mean, you know, there's, uh, there's other health benefits. Of course, it's got uh, 9 billion living probiotics, so it's supposed to be really good for your gut health. Uh, I mean, it's just like, you know, this is like the wonder drink. And boy, I tell you, it tastes good. I got the Trilogy which is, uh, I'll give, give you the uh, ingredients here. It's made with uh, raspberry juice, lemon juice, and uh, prepared ginger juice. I mean, ginger is good for you regardless. So this stuff is, so it's a multi-juice uh, thing and, and it's carbonated. So this would be a great replacement for a, a pop. I mean, I drink way too much pop, but this thing's expensive. I mean, even with the coupon, I think I paid about nine bucks. <laughs> But, but that's a pretty good size for nine bucks for something that's so good for you. I know that sounds crazy to start the video with that, but I just discovered this. Now, I drink kefir too, and kefir is an excellent, uh, like, uh, you know, milk byproduct or, or a dairy pride byproduct that's excellent for your gut health and has other different benefits than the uh, kombucha. So just, and it, you can get the kefir in, in Walmart or anywhere else. Now, don't. Be careful when you buy the kefir. A lot of a lot of the kefir, they put all the sugar in there, the, the manufacturers, because you know that the, the food companies are trying to poison you and kill you. That's why JFK, if we can get him in there, he's going to take on the uh, the food processing companies and hopefully we'll get some healthy food. But get the kefir. I know you might not like the taste. I, don't, I like the taste, but get the one without the sugar. If it's flavored for strawberry or blueberry or all that, that's, that's just, it's either artificial sugar or sugar. So... The next topic we're going to get into is I was thinking about the hurricanes. Now, I want to focus on Florida for most of what I'm going to talk about here because I've been doing a lot of research. And, uh, and I was just, and of course, I'm thinking about things. You know, right now, silver is at almost $32 an ounce. And Russia, the central bank there, they're buying up hordes of silver. So it's becoming more and more rare. Uh, I, I think we're going to hit $50 silver here in the next. Well, who knows? I mean, you know, but it's soon. Let's just say soon. I don't want to make a prediction on the time frame because I've been wrong. I've been, <laughs> I've been buying silver since the year 2000. And uh, it just it's just now hitting $32 an ounce. Of course, back then I was getting it at $4 an ounce. So I've done pretty good over that investment. You know, I wish I wasn't a buyer and holder and could swing trade like Johnny Bravo. Maybe someday I'll learn how to do that. But I just only have so much time. Anyway, what I want to do is convert that silver into real estate. So but in the process, I get interested in other other videos. And so I've been watching the videos on the devastation that took place in, in uh, near Tampa Bay, uh, Sarasota, right around in that area. Unbelievable how many houses are completely destroyed. And, uh, I, you know, the people will never be able to live in those houses ever again unless they completely rebuild. But rebuilding is going to be impossible, at least in today's environment. Now, maybe in the future, it might change. And so I have a Tremendous idea. So right now, I, one of the things that, that these people had to do because the insurance rates had gone up so high in Florida, a lot of them were self-insuring, so they had no insurance. Think about that. You just lost everything and you got no insurance. And you're saying, well, that cybersecurity guy, you've been talking about self-insuring. Well, I'm pretty holed up here in the middle of central Florida. And uh, I mean, you know, a tree could fall on my house, so self-insurance might go wrong. But uh Good Lord, you think I'm going to pay $4,000 a year for homeowner's insurance? Now, you have to have your mortgage paid off, okay, to be able to do that. But that's that's my plan. I'm going to self-insure because even, even here in Central Florida, the insurance rates are going to go up. And then the people that did actually have flood insurance, I didn't realize, 
it covers 250,000 for the house and I think it was 100,000 for your belongings. So think of what they lost. That's all they're going to get. So I want to put out a plea to, you know, Rick Scott, uh, Marco Rubio, uh, you know, G Governor DeSantis, uh, you know, um, geez, I mean, we have got to do something for these Floridians. Now, we can in Florida because Florida is a tourist state. And I guarantee you, even though all this has taken place, the tourism is going to kick up. This is the time of the year. We're going to be making millions and millions in the budget. And what I want the, the, government, the state government to do, because you can't, I mean, the federal government, that's, these are Democrats. They couldn't give a shit about you or me or Americans in general that are in, the, in power right now. Now, I think if Trump gets in, we might be able to get some help for Americans, but it, I don't know. The Democrats cheat real well, and I, I'm not sure. I, everybody keeps saying Trump's ahead in the polls. The polls don't matter, man. That's what I keep telling people. It's not what the polls are saying. It's how well you can cheat. Who can gather the most ballots and put them in? If you can go into a nursing home and somebody's laying there in a coma and put their, your fake their signature on a ballot, that's a vote. That's a vote, right? If you can get a bunch of illegal aliens, get an ID and let them go in, that's a, that's a ballot. I mean, I can't call it a vote. It's a ballot. So you can see where we're heading with this thing. So I'm not so sure Trump's going to get in. And that means that there's going to be no money for Americans whatsoever. Democrats hate the American people. Okay, understand that. Democrats hate the American people. They're all about their authoritarian, warmongering power. That's all, all life is to a Democrat. All right, so getting back to the housing. I know I, I'm getting political here, just somewhat, because, you know, I just, I just don't like the fact that FEMA hasn't done anything for, for the Americans, but DeSantis, you can. Now, here's my idea, all right? So the state goes in and buys up all of these properties to, and, and, and gives the, the homeowners... A, now think about it. Some of these homes were worth six hundred, seven hundred thousand. Okay. Now I don't expect the state to give them the, the the full worth of what the house used to be worth, but we can come in there somewhere, give them four hundred thousand, and buy that property. Now, so the state is going to own all of this property. Okay. Now what we could do, we can convert that into some natural areas. Okay. Much like the Akala National Forest. Let's take that as an example. So you're going to say, well. You know, that cybersecurity guy, not everybody is going to sell to the state. So how are you going to convert that into a natural area? Well, there's people, there's all kinds of houses that were grandfathered into the Akala National Forest. So anybody that wants to stay or wants to rebuild their house, they can be grandfathered into the area. But I'm going to tell you, the majority of the people, if you offer them a fair price, they're going to sell because they don't want to go through this again. I mean, imagine if you're living in a house and in the last couple months, Two hurricanes have come through and wiped you out twice. Some of these people were just starting to rebuild before the second hurricane. You know, Milton came through and wiped them out again. And what a lot of people don't understand, it's not just the people that live on the coast. Because that, when that storm went across, it flooded all our rivers. So now all the people that were living close to the rivers, all their houses are gone. So we can widen out those natural areas. Now, understand what natural areas do. It'll buffer the coastline. So that means that people are further back... From the, uh, from the coastline who want to build, okay, they'll be taken care of. So that's, that's one good benefit. Same with the rivers. If you put in natural areas next to the rivers, even though those rivers overflow, all that natural forest and everything buffers the people that live further out. Now, so, so that's my idea. Let's, and plus it helps the watershed. Okay, this will help our water quality in Florida. So let's use that tourist taxpayer money to buy up all of this real estate and housing and give people a fair price so that they can go someplace else, they're probably not going to want to live in Florida because their experience here is devastating. And especially even with that money, if they can't afford a house in cash, you know, you, you, can't, you can't afford insurance in Florida anymore. It's impossible. If you can't pay cash for a house, you're done. So anyway, and then the other thing is, if Florida wants to later on develop that land and sell it to private investors so that they can you know, put in housing, now here's what we're going to have to do. Anything that gets rebuilt has to be hurricane proof. So I've been doing a lot of research on hurricane proof housing, and that was my total focus. Now, if, you, if, you're, gonna, if you're out there just buying a house, there's a bunch, and I'm going to do another video on just housing alone. But there's all kinds of modular housing, uh, manufactured housing, uh, we got the boxable houses that are just now coming online. Now, they've been working since 19, 
17. I wanted to talk about YouTube for a minute. I've told you there is no disinformation, there's bad information, and there's con artists. There are a lot of videos on YouTube that are all about, you know, the Tesla tiny home and the boxable housing and, and dropping cars on top of the, the buildings. And I kept looking. I said, well, what is the durability of these box homes? Well, they didn't exist. They didn't exist. They're just now coming online in 2024. So they might start coming out. There's another company up in Canada called Seed, S-E-E-D. Now, they've been in industrial manufacturing. So they're taking an industrial manufacturing approach to building affordable housing. So what's the advantage of an industrial approach? Well, everything in the house is steel. I mean, they don't have a place. I'm just giving you an example. Right now, this is only in Canada, but this is just an example. So, but they are going to come to the United States, let's say in two years. Okay, so in Florida, a steel house is ideal because we got termites galore. You don't want a wooden house in Florida. I told you you want a block house, but this is going to be even better. This is going to be a steel house and they can bring it in and it's, it's, you know, 1,100 square feet is, I mean, and by the way, you see all these advertisements for like $10,000 house, $9,000. That's all bull crap. Anytime you see a title on a video, that's all bull crap. Even the boxable houses are now are going to be selling for around, well, in today's dollars, now with inflation, what's going to keep going up, but you're looking at about $60,000. And then the transportation costs, uh, you know, but that was very affordable. The seed houses, they can transport them for about $1,500 Canadian. So... And that was a long ways away. So a lot of the housing, you know, even transporting it from these companies. Now, one of the companies that I looked into was uh, it was out of Asheville, uh, Tennessee. I can't remember. Uh, it's called Delta Construction. I don't know. I'll do a video on it. But I was so I finally found a statistic. And the houses, the four, the houses they're building, can survive up to 900 mile an hour winds. I mean, not 900, 109. <laughs> 90 mile an hour winds, sorry. I, my brain went off. Okay, man, boy, if it could survive 900 mile an hour winds, that'd be something else, wouldn't it? Oh, my God. So 190 mile an hour winds. So we've, we've mitigated the wind problem. But if you're going to build, you know, anywhere near the coast on Florida, you're going to have to build that house on some sort of raised construction. And that means that raised construction is going to have to be as sturdy as the house. Because that, when that water comes in, water is a destructive force, as we saw in North Carolina. All right? So, so we got that. There's also a place out in Arizona, and they're building houses out there. So if you want to buy a, uh, a house, I can't remember. It starts with a Z, Zilla, I think, Zilla houses. All right, and they're outstanding construction, and they're just coming online. So now a lot of these modular companies are scams. Okay, you can go up on, they got these beautiful websites and everything, and they'll tell you, oh, yeah, you know, we got houses. Folks, if you can't go look at some of the houses that they've put in, somewhere or, or you know a, a model home which is you don't buy over the internet you know of course the boxable they're coming out with a what is it called a, a mini boxable or something or uh it's going to be just a little 300 square foot but i mean it's supposed to be completely portable and you can drop it anywhere so uh and then let's get into the self-sufficiency of these homes all right so i want to live i want to have a place someday in the ocala national forest I want to be off grid for everything. Now I told you we've talked about drilling wells to get your water and all of that. Well, these these homes, you know, like the ones in uh, North Carolina and the other ones, uh, they come with their own water supply. Okay, now you're going to have to refill that water supply, so you might have to pay to have a water truck come in and refill it from time to time. And I'm not sure how they're going to handle the sewerage. I didn't see anything about how these houses are going to handle the sewerage. That's another big question for me. But as far as your electrical requirements go, most all of them came with some sort of solar setup. Uh, now, the, the boxable home is going to be Tesla panels and the Tesla batteries. So you're completely off the grid as far as your electrical concerns go. All right. And you're off the grid as far as your water, because these are the two, two big, big things. And then also, can the house survive? And that's that's what I was looking into for these hurricane homes. So we've got in the next year or two now. So I want to I, I hate to call him out, but I'm going to call out the economic ninja. Now, you know, he's all about the old way of, of doing housing. You know, he's about going out and buying cheap real estate, maybe doing a minimal amount of work, waiting for the, the, the tide of the market because right now we're in it we're in a depression the market's going to go way down you're going to be picking up housing and real estate for pennies on the dollar he's completely correct right there okay but what are you going to do with that real estate okay so mainly you're going to you're going to either fix it up or you're going to rent it out which renting is a pain in the butt okay or you're going to uh 
uh, you know, uh, do a minimum amount of, of work and then wait maybe a year or two as you're renting it until the housing market uh, turns around, you know, because we're heading for a new currency. So this whole thing's going to have to stabilize. You might be holding on to that property. Well, you're not going to buy now, but it, you know, if you buy in a year, you might be holding on to that property for a while before you can get a decent profit out of it. Now, I, no doubt the ninja, and he knows all the financing stuff and everything. I don't know a damn thing about any of that. But I like I like the idea of these these modular houses and dropping them in, and then and also the durability of them. You know, Ninja's still buying stick built housing. You know, you get a you get a tornado that comes through. Think about it. I don't think a, I think one of these houses at 190 mile under winds would survive a tornado. How many houses can you say that would survive a tornado? North Carolina. I did want to talk about that now. Another thing that we have to do as a nation is we have to do geological surveys in the future for where we're going to build communities and housing okay and i want to describe to you what took place in north carolina uh, tennessee okay now years past th these mountains they, this isn't the first rodeo these mountains have been through so when that water accumulates there's there's ravines or, or rivulets where that water accumulates and everything goes into one channel and then that sweeps down the mountain just picking up all kinds of debris and then and so what happened was these communities had built in areas where that debris just slammed into them, okay? And it came in waves. So there were instances where the, uh, the, the rescue crews went in after the first wave came through, and then the second wave came through and took out the rescue crews, all right? Because it was the same channel. It's coming down the mountain. A lot, you would think that people living in the mountains would understand this. Now, why did they build in these areas? Well, a hundred years ago, maybe that's, that's so, and I think that was when the last big flood took place. It flattened out. All of that debris came down and it made these wonderfully kind of flat areas where you could just go right in and build your houses. So it was excellent, excellent land to build on because you're not, you know, think about building on a mountainside. You know, that's expensive, man. You got to cut into the mountain and all of that. You know, the people that do it, I mean, they got the money, but if you, you're just the average homeowner and you just want to get in there, well, back in the day for 60, 100,000, maybe 150,000 or whatever, you know, you're going to build in these areas where the mudslides are going to come down because the, the land is such that it supports that type of construction. But so in the future now, we want to look at where these rivulets are that come down. And by the way, these rivulets are fed from multiple streams. And so that's why it was so incredible. I mean, it was incredible the mud and everything that came down those mountains. All right, so we don't want to rebuild these communities in these locations. I don't care if you've even got a 190 mile an hour home. <laughs> it ain't going to survive an avalanche coming down a mountain. Okay, so we need to do geological surveys. And then the, the state of North Carolina or South Carolina, Georgia, uh, Tennessee, you know, hopefully they're going to come in and they're going to say, okay, we, now the people that, that can still live there, you're not going to kick them out. This, this was a once in a hundred year event, okay? But, you know, if they want to stay, that is. Uh, but what I'm saying is they should be saying, nope, we're not going to allow building in these areas and turn, once again, turn it into state land and make it, you know, natural land so that the next time this happens in 50 years from now or whatever, there's not a bunch of people in the path to get killed, right? So that's it. I mean, I wanted to talk about flooding, you know, hurricane proof homes and there's many varieties of hurricane proof homes okay you know and you're gonna have to do your own research and like i said make make sure you're not just buying from from some charlatan and then the other thing is do, there's 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 ways to get those homes in like that that mini home they're just they can just bring the home in straight from the manufacturer and drop it now these other uh, uh manufactured homes or modular homes or whatever you're going to get you know you're going to want to go through a middleman and a real estate agent or a, a, a buyer's real estate agent not a seller's real estate agent so that they can help you navigate everything that you need to do to get this home in there and and by the way make sure you're putting it up off the ground even here in florida we are still building homes that lay right on the ground if we get flooding in my area i had dare say if that hurricane had come through right where i am we would have been screwed so we're going to finish off the video with just a little bit of geopolitics i know i talked a long time uh, this is about a Nevada woman under Trump. I got a home. Under Biden, I was ruined. Under your administration, I was able to afford a home. She's talking to Trump. I got the video here. Under the Biden administration, I was forced to take the COVID-19 vaccine and I refused. 
I was, I guess this is a veteran, I was honorably discharged and my savings dwindled under the Biden-Harris economy. Let's watch that video now since we're talking about housing, right? I decided to join the Air Force um, and I joined proudly because I had grown up with a sense of service and sense of wanting to do more in my country. Under your administration, I was able to afford a home. I was able to buy my first home and save money. And it was the first time I'd have been able to get ahead. And feeling like I'd always been behind, your administration was the, at the point where I was able to get ahead. Under the Biden administration, I was, uh, I was forced to take the COVID-19 vaccine. And I refused as a religious accommodation. And I was honorably discharged. Um, and with that, I, most of my savings dwindled under, their, it, under the Biden-Harris economy. And I had found myself having to work two jobs, having to do rideshare and having to do um, graphic designing to make ends meet at that point. Um, I was raised in a democratic household. I, my values remain consistent. Mr. President, you were the first Republican president I voted for in 2016. <laughs> This is, this is now a homeless person because of the Democrats. We're in very dangerous shape. We're in very bad shape as a country. You look at all of the things that are happening that are so bad, and it's just something we can't take. So we are going to be with you. You've been with me. Uh, get out and vote. And again, November 5th, I believe, is going to go down as maybe the most important day, I hope. Right, Mr. Congressman? Uh, but I hope it will because it'll show what we do, but it'll be the most important day in the history of the country. And, uh, you know, I said that with 2016 and I meant it, but this blows it away because 2016 we had problems, but we didn't have this kind of problem. We have a problem of survival of our country because we're run by very stupid and probably evil people. And we can't have it. So thank you very much, Bob. I hope that's a positive message. Is that a positive message? Thank you. For there you go. So there was that video. The next one. Now, so now we're going to get into the uh, uh, Israel, Iran, because uh, Iran. I mean, Israel hasn't bombed Iran yet. Uh, though, although we, a lot of people speculate that's in the cards. It could be three months from now. Who knows? This is Sprinter, American magazine on the weakness of Israel in the face of Iran. American magazine, National Internet, acknowledged that Hezbollah has significant weapons and stressed that the is that the Israel alone will not be able to confront Iran. The American magazine emphasizes that Israel should be careful about the consequences of its dominance in the region. It is noted that Tel Aviv is once again at a crossroads. The Israeli attacks on Lebanon are increasing. As Tel Aviv believes that such actions can reduce tensions, however, the attacks could spread to neighboring regions. Uh, and we've talked about that. Uh, and then, anyway, I won't put any more on this video except I'm going to tack on. This is a video out of RT where he's a, uh, a professor in Iran is talking about that when and if uh, Israel attacks Iran, these could be the consequences. Peace out. Stay free. Let's cross now live to a professor at Tehran University, Sayed Mohammed Marandi. Professor Marandi, I'm glad to have you join me now. So media reports online say that Iran asked the Gulf states not to help Israel target its territory. Now, what do you make of that? Well, if an uh, uh, oil-rich uh, family uh, regimes in the Persian Gulf assist the Americans or facilitate the Americans or the Israelis, uh, that would mean that they are part of the hostility. They would be taking sides, and that would be an act of aggression, and therefore they would be severely punished. Iran could easily destroy all the oil and gas infrastructures in the countries across the Persian Gulf with its drones. Uh, within hours, uh, the global oil and gas market uh, would explode, and uh, that would lead to a a global uh, economic crisis that we've never seen before. So uh, it would be very smart for the United States in particular uh, not to get involved because uh, if they do, Iran will not accept any excuses from those regimes that host American bases. 
And of course, if by any means these regimes help the Israelis or facilitate the Israeli regime, then of course that's the same the same outcome will happen. We'll have the same outcome. Now, the reports also suggest that now the Gulf states are lobbying the United States to persuade Israel out of striking Iran. Now, how likely is that from the window of the U.S. persuading Israel out of striking Iran? The United States uh, says many things, but in reality, it does something else. The United States has been talking about pushing for a ceasefire, whereas we've known all along that the United States has been enabling the Israeli regime to carry out the Holocaust in Gaza and the genocidal strikes in Lebanon. We now know that the U.S. Secretary of State Blinken actually approved the bombing of aid trucks in Gaza. So the United States is uh, a part of this, uh, a part of this ongoing genocide, and the same is true with the EU, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. They're all uh, a part of this ongoing Holocaust. They, the, the crimes that they, the Israeli regime is committing on an, an on, on a daily basis, on an hourly basis. Every single one of these crimes uh, all, are also being carried out by these countries. Now, there is a risk Iran will review its nuclear doctrine, with Tehran saying that any attack from Israel will have dire consequences. Now, what are the chances of Iran actually raising the stakes? Uh, and a, and a foreign, uh, let's say, a foreign policy advisor to the leader twice over the last year or so uh, Dr. Kamal Kharazi, who was also the foreign minister during the Khatami administration. He said that uh, there are under circumstances where there is a, uh, an, a, a, a real threat, a, a nuclear threat, either to, I, I would assume, Iran's nuclear installations or to Iran directly, that Iran's nuclear posture would change. Now, I'm paraphrasing, and, and I should go over the sentence more carefully, but the point is that uh, the Iranian nuclear program is very well protected. It is built, it has been built to protect it from American strikes. Uh, and therefore, any Israeli attack could only have limited damage, just as uh, Israeli attacks on Iranian military installations would have limited effect because almost everything that is very sensitive has been built underground to protect Iran from the United States ever since the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan. But this is a statement made by the the foreign one of the two foreign policy advisors of the leader. And he, again, he said it twice. He never retracted. And I assume that he has authorization to say that. So there are circumstances where Iran's nuclear posture would change. And if it does, the Americans and the Israelis will not be able to do anything about it, the Israeli regime. And Iran uh, will uh, leave the NPT, of course, as well. All right. In your opinion, is this what might be the last red line as Iran previously let Israel and the U.S. get away with many things? Well, remember, the United States and the Israelis have carried out many uh, provocations. They, uh, we all know they carried out the world's first cyber attack on Iran's nuclear program, which was very dangerous, and it could have uh, created uh, a nuclear catastrophe. It could have contaminated the installation. Uh, they uh, uh, murdered a number of Iranian scientists. They did this together because... The Mujahideen al terrorist cult that uh, exists across Europe and North America and is funded by the West and which fought for Saddam Hussein against Iran, uh, they were used by the Israelis uh, to gather intelligence and to help assassinate Iranian scientists. So the Americans and the Israelis together assassinated Iranian scientists. And one of them was a colleague of mine at the University of Tehran who was murdered in front of his wife. Uh, then the Israeli regime, probably again, probably with we uh, Amer uh, Western support, because remember, all of their intelligence comes from the Five Eyes, U.S. and uh, the CIA. It's the Israeli can't do these things on its own. So they murdered the deputy uh, defense secretary in Iran, 
All of these happened before any Iranian retaliation, including ma murdering many Iranian soldiers who were in Syria helping with the fight against ISIS and Al-Qaeda. But more recently, they bombed the embassy. Iran responded. Then again, they assassinated and murdered uh, Mr. Haniye in Tehran, along with a companion of his, and the Iranians responded again. This time when Iran responded, we saw it was much more serious. The regime was unable to block Iranian missiles. But if the Israeli regime carries out a strike, which we expect to, to happen, then the Iranian response will be much more massive. They've already promised this. And as I've said many times before, when the Iranians say they're going to do something, they will do it. All right, we have to leave you here now. Professor at Tehran University, Sayed Mohammed Marandi, thank you so much for your insight. Thank you. You little scumbag! I got your name! I got your ass! You will not laugh! You will not cry! You will learn by the numbers! Happy Pride! Happy Pride Month, and actually, let's declare it a summer of pride. So you're a killer? Sir, yes, sir! Let me see your war face! Sir, you got a war face? Ah! That's a war face! Now let me see your war face! Ah! Bullshit! You didn't convince me! Let me see your real war face! You will be a weapon! You will be a minister of death, praying for war. But until that day, you are puked. You are the lowest form of life on earth. You are not even human fucking beings. You are nothing but unorganized, grabastic pieces of amphibian shit. How to abracadabra, these bitches know I got answers the way I... It looks to me like the best part of you ran down to crack your mama's ass and ended up as a brown stain on the mattress. <laughs> Let's be no just who I am. Let's be no just who I am.